All right, everyone, we're going to begin our second panel. And I, I must say thank you to our first panel and to the audience for teeing up our panel on better governance. So far better than we could ever have anticipated. Clearly, there is a lot of interest in trusteeship. And I think it's uh, only appropriate and uh, historical to uh, make a reference to our founding now nearly 20 years ago. And one of our founding purposes was really to re-engage and revisit higher education stewardship because it was our contention that in many ways trustees were not doing their job appropriately. And so obviously that will be the context of our discussion today where we are going to be talking about governance for a new era. Now, as you all know, lay governance has long been, I think, one of the greatest principles of American higher education. Uh, in the words of Harvard, former Harvard President Derek Bach, lay trustees serve as a mediating force, really tying the college and university to the needs of the greater society. We heard Paul talking about Democratic and Republican appointees, and I think that's very much part of lay trusteeship. It changes from administration to administration, but these appointees represent the elected officials and, again, tie our institutions to the greater society. But clearly there are challenges of both education and of uh, dealing with other constituencies, and I think that is something that we at ACTA are engaged in each and every day. Uh, it is fair to say that many people are not happy with trustees' performance, and a recent survey commissioned by us found that a majority of Americans believe that taxpayers and families are not getting value for their investment. Uh, many of them see tenure as a system that adds to cost and compromises quality, and they fear that political correctness and intolerance are undermining the free exchange of ideas. This very same survey felt that 90% said that it was time for the trustees to address these issues. Now, one of the issues that's come up over the years is exactly whom do trustees represent? And Henry Clay is known for many things, but I'll bet you don't know that he really is eloquent on the topic of trustees, and I want to uh, raise his uh, point in this regard. Government is a trust, and the officers of the government are trustees, and both the trust and trustees are created for the benefit of the people. The duty of trustees is to act for the people. This is a definition of trusteeship that ACTA has long endorsed, and yet it is not a definition that commands widespread agreement within the academy. If you listen to the students, they think they're in charge. If you listen to the faculty, they think they're in charge. If you listen to the coach, he thinks he's in charge. You have many competing perspectives. Uh, but at the end of the day, the trustees are legally responsible, and they are res responsible to the people. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is the latest iteration on governance, governance for a new era. Now, uh, ACTA convened uh, a group of top-notch, blue-chip civic and higher education leaders earlier this year to come together to talk about uh, trusteeship and to develop a blueprint for higher education trustees. The report was designed to help America's colleges and universities shed 20th century thinking and successfully meet 21st century challenges, as I think we've all heard. Uh, these are times of immense change and challenge in higher education. Uh, since 2008 and the economic downturn, uh, many institutions have found uh, their state appropriations diminished. Uh, in many places, their enrollments, they're not able to maintain. So there are a range of new challenges that trustees are being asked to undertake. Now, the report's key findings, I think, are uh, important ones, and we'll be talking about them here today. But let me just go over them briefly. Shared governance cannot and must not be an excuse for board inaction. Leadership of higher education is out of balance. Too many trustees have seen their role narrowly defined as boosters. Trustees are fiduciaries for their institution, but as I've just said, have a primary obligation to the taxpayers. Uh, 
Trustees are indeed responsible for not only the financial health, but also the academic health. What does that mean? How can they properly engage the academic health? That's something we'll talk about here. And then to get to the issue of education, which we heard about in the previous panel, how do we educate trustees so that they are informed and engaged and can deal with these serious challenges uh, that we are finding at so many institutions? Now, I'm happy to say that after this group convened and after it issued governance for a new era, we have this remarkable statement, and it has already had resonance around the country. Uh, the Oklahoman had a marvelous editorial endorsing engaged and thoughtful trustees. Forbes took a look at this report and called it just good common sense. And we are already seeing trustees around the country start to embrace uh, the various recommendations that it has made. Now, one of the things I want to uh, emphasize before we begin is that ACTA has long worked with training college and university trustees. We work with the Aspen Institute and we have small sessions around the country where we bring people together to talk about uh, great books as well as principles of trusteeship. But the one thing we do understand is what Paul Tribble was saying is that trustees come and go. So yes, we can train them and we want to do that, but at the same time, uh, in four, five, six years, depending upon the terms, you will have new trustees. And so it is important, we believe, uh, to, to have trustees focused on key issues of quality and cost. And so I hope you all will take a look in your materials because you will see in it two follow-up uh, pieces that we have just sent to more than 16,000 trustees around the country, including a card, 10 questions trustees should ask. This gets back again to the question, I mean, how do we get trustees focused on the data? These questions are designed to help trustees ask the key questions that will get to these issues of quality and cost that we have been talking about this morning. So let me begin with a brief introduction of our incredible panelists. We're going to start today with Benno Schmidt. Uh, he is known well to the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, First Amendment scholar, expert on academic freedom, former Yale president, and a very accomplished chairman of the board of the City University of New York, which has done more for access, quality, and affordability than virtually any system in the country. I should add that Benno is a Merrill Award winner, and he is the chair of the Governance for a New Era project that we'll be talking about. Next to him is Casey Johnson, another rock star of higher education reform. Casey is also a former Merrill Award winner and a distinguished 20th century historian and prolific writer. All of you may remember that he received a special signed picture of LBJ when he received the Merrill Prize, underscoring his exceptional scholarship on LBJ. But I think you'll also remember that KC is the co-author of Until Proven Innocent, the story of the Duke lacrosse case. We have the book in the back. You can have him sign it for you if you have not already obtained a copy. And last, we have Rich DeMello, author of Abelard to Apple, also available for you in the back. He is director of the Center for the 20 First Century University at Georgia Tech. He is a distinguished professor of computing and professor of management and has written eloquently on a range of education issues from accreditation to governance. Rich has a background not only as a scholar but also as a chief technology officer of Hewlett Packard and he has held executive positions at the National Science Foundation and the Department of Defense. All three of these were signatories to governance for a new era and they will talk to you about this groundbreaking report this morning. So Benno, take it away. Uh, well, thank you, Ann, um, and I'm delighted uh, to be here uh, today and uh, we're going to say a little bit up here, but then we're going to leave plenty of time for questions and comments uh, by all of you. I'm very eager to hear what you have to say. Uh, I think American higher education um, often presents a, uh, a front of uh, a somewhat false or at least incomplete uh, quality and success because we have a majority of the top universities in the world, um, we think of American higher education as uh, the strongest in the world. But I think when you get beyond these, uh, these top universities, you see some very real uh, problems in higher ed. Uh, the public believes 
uh, higher education is far too costly. Uh, student debt is out of control uh, uh, in our society. Most employers believe that the majority of college graduates uh, they hire don't know how to write or communicate or uh, analyze uh, a complex uh, uh, problems. Uh, when you get b below the, the, the better universities, our graduation rates are shockingly, shockingly low. Uh, in community colleges uh, in our cities around the country, only about one in five students graduates. Think of the waste of, uh, uh, of that. And graduation rates at many four-year institutions uh, are only 50, 60 percent. I mean, it's the dropout rate is far worse in higher education than it is in K-12, where it gets so much, uh, uh, so much attention. Uh, part of the problem uh, with higher education, I believe, and this came up in the, in the panel that uh, we just uh, heard, is that trustees have too often seen their role as being cheerleaders and boosters uh, and fundraisers and donors. That was not always so. For, uh, for many years, uh, lay governance of American higher education was a, was a source of, uh, of tremendous strength. But um, as we discovered on the last panel, there's been a growing sense that trustees just aren't doing their job. Um, because of that, ACTA asked me to uh, bring together a, a group of people uh, to look at the question of, of trustee governance. And uh, we had a very, I think, strong group uh, uh, pulled together, a very diverse group. Uh, Arizona State President uh, Michael Crow, the former University of Colorado President uh, Hank Brown, Tom McMillan, who's uh, 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 a regent, uh, con former congressman, former Rhodes Scholar, uh, the only, played on the New York Knicks, the only pro basketball team that had two Rhodes Scholars, Tom and uh, Bill Bradley. Um, Tom is currently um, uh, a, a regent of the University uh, of Maryland. R Rich DeMillo, who's here on the panel um, uh, from Georgia Tech, John Engler, the president of the Business uh, uh, Roundtable and former governor of Michigan. Jonathan Cole, uh, the longtime provost at, uh, at Columbia University, where we are uh, today. My friend KC Johnson, my fellow uh, CUNY person, and many others. And to my surprise, when we, when we pull this group together, for a day, and I, I tried to do a draft that summarized our feelings. The group was unanimous uh, around the following findings. Too many trustees see their role far too narrowly. Trustees' responsibilities go beyond the walls of the institution. They are the tie between, between the universities and colleges and the public and taxpayers whom these universities and college serve. Trustees must ensure the quality of education. They must look at student learning outcomes. Trustees cannot, must not, leave the, that critical issue in higher education uh, just uh, to the uh, faculty. Uh, and. Uh, Boards must be active on all issues that affect the quality, the effectiveness, the cost uh, of, of their uh, institutions. The panel that I chaired uh, was unanimous in concluding that <coughs> trustees must ensure academic freedom at their institutions. Controversial speakers must not be uh, inhibited uh, from appearing to speak uh, in colleges and universities. Uh, and trustees need to ensure that the institution 
uh, represents effective disciplinary diversity so that students have an opportunity to hear all the legitimate uh, and, uh, and relevant uh, uh, points of view about the, uh, about the issues uh, which they study. Uh, we agree that trustees must insist on data about academic performance, efficiency, cost, quality, uh, and the data that trustees need and must insist upon must give the trustees the opportunity to make independent judgments and to ask the hard questions of their presidents and provosts and chancellors and deans. Um, trustees need to particularly focus on data that uh, reveals student learning. Very few boards today look at that data or have data that really enables them to make an independent judgment about what students are learning or not learning uh, at their uh, institutions. Um, trustees need to uh, reflect their broad preparation uh, in terms of what courses are required for students to be good citizens, to be uh, productive and, and constructive members of their, uh, of, of their communities. That cannot and should not be left to the faculty. Uh, we heard in the last panel the most critical responsibility of trustees is to appoint academic leaders who will defend these values and who will insist uh, on providing data that enables trustees to make independent judgments about the critical issues of quality and performance uh, uh, at their uh, institution. Trustees need to be able to insist on and have access to data independent of what's provided by the president and provost if the trustees uh, need it. And the whole process of trustee selection has to be regarded as one of the most important uh, uh, decisions that will affect the quality uh, uh, of, of institutions. Um, now, <coughs> many of these decisions uh, on many campuses are seen as the purview of the faculty. And I think it is appropriate that the faculty have the first crack at these issues, issues about uh, disciplinary diversity, about the curriculum, about whether there are core curriculum and required courses, and so forth. But, trust, but faculty cannot have the last word on these issues. Trustees are the fiduciaries who are responsible for the quality of the institution. And they cannot defer to the faculty on critical questions involving the institution's quality and performance. My own view is that faculty will get these, dis these questions uh, right uh, uh, 90, 95 percent of the time, maybe even more, but trustees have to be willing to step in in those instances where the faculty uh, does not adequately reflect the need for the institution to be a strong performer for taxpayers uh, uh, and, and the public. Uh, and the idea that faculty uh, have the last word on governance on key questions about institutional performance is simply not adequate to the complexities and importance of higher education uh, in, in our society. The trustees are the only body, well the president and the, and the provost too, but who looks at the overall performance and quality of the institution that can relate financial questions uh, and economic questions to questions of academic quality 
uh, and so on. So we called in, in our report, as, as Anne said, for a, a, a new focus on independent, active, and well-informed trustees to help uh, guide the, help shape and, and, and guide the future of uh, these critically important institutions in our society. They are not in good health today, and that is uh, many of them. Uh, perhaps uh, the majority of them are not. And that should be a matter of, uh, of the responsibility of trustees to work to, to try to correct. Uh, as, as Benno mentioned, I was a signatory to the Schmidt Report and I signed as a faculty member, a faculty member who believes that it's important that trustees play a more robust role in shared governance, oftentimes to act as a check on the worst impulses of the faculty, or to state it more bluntly, sometimes to save the faculty from themselves. And the Schmidt Report makes two recommendations directly regarding areas that too often, as Benno was saying, have come to be seen incorrectly as an exclusive uh, preserve of the faculty. Uh, Anne asked me to speak about these a bit. The first relates uh, to personnel matters, both hiring and tenuring matters. And the second relates to curricular matters, especially the question of disciplinary diversity. First, with regards to personnel matters. There is, as Benno says, an assumption that for the most point, part, faculty get these decisions correct. It may be that with regards to hiring or with regards to tenuring, the decision is not often the best one, but it is a logical and a defensive one, and the faculty should be given due deference. But there are cases that fall as outliers, issues where obviously qualified candidates are denied either hiring or tenure as a result of inappropriate criteria used by the faculty, or at the other extreme, cases in which obviously unqualified candidates are hired or given tenure again on the basis of inappropriate uh, actions. I, as many of you know, have uh, firsthand experience with the first of these uh, matters. I would not be here today were it not for Benno and a couple of other members of the board. When I came up for tenure at Brooklyn College, uh, uh, members of my department who didn't like positions that I had taken uh, in a departmental search and on a campus issue regarding uh, anti-Israel activity, decided that they would just assume that I not uh, get uh, tenure. They made no pretense that they were making their decision on academic grounds. They said that my scholarship, my teaching, my service was fine, um, but they didn't want me around and they searched around for a variety of criteria and eventually came up with uncollegiality. And, uh, and of course, I'm a very uncollegial person, so that's that. Um, when word uh, of this uh, got to Benno and got to a couple of other members of the board, they acted in the spirit that we see in the Schmidt uh, report, which is that they reached out to the then chancellor of CUNY, Matt Goldstein, to the general counsel of CUNY, Rick Schaefer, and they said, basically, we want, we want to know what's going on. Uh, does this uh, look as bad as it is? And uh, uh, Matt and Rick came back and said, yes, it basically is. Uh, they then took uh, appropriate remedial action. They took my case out of Brooklyn College. Uh, I was evaluated by other CUNY faculty. I was interviewed by Chancellor Goldstein and the board ultimately acted. The faculty didn't like it. Uh, the University Faculty Senate uh, passed a resolution with a vote of 67 to 1 <laughs> condemning the Board of Trustees' uh, uh, actions. Um, but I think in retrospect, uh, many of those who voted on that would now concede the board was correct. There are instances, again, sort of ripped from the headlines on the other extreme. Uh, where I, I think you could make a case that, that trustees did not act quickly enough to uh, salvage the reputation of their university. And in the last six months or so, the best example of that, it seems to me, is this case at the University of Illinois, the Stephen Salata case. And a quick background for those of you who don't know it, Salata was a professor at Virginia Tech. He was hired by the American Indian Studies Department uh, at the University of Illinois even though his writing consisted exclusively of publications about Israel. 
Um, I'm not an expert in American Indian studies, but generally Israel uh, doesn't have a lot of American Indians, uh, and the relationship between these two uh, approaches seemed rather dubious. In fact, what appeared to have occurred is that a very strongly anti-Zionist department saw in, uh, that they wanted to hire another anti-Zionist and essentially created a position for him. The trustees, uh, it's not clear that the trustees even knew about this uh, decision when it was made, but they didn't know in part because of a failure of the University of Illinois administration. Someone in the administration knew that this guy was being uh, uh, hired, didn't bring it to the attention of the board until the matter blew up as a result of a series of sort of fanatically anti-Zionist uh, tweets uh, by Saleda over the summer in which she you know, uh, reminisced about the possibility of all Israelis in the West Bank uh, being disappeared. And at that point, the trustees did step in. They decided not to go ahead with the appointment. But by then, they're probably going to have to make a substantial payoff uh, to Saleda. The university suffered reputational harm. A more decisive action by the trustees and by the administration at an earlier stage would have saved the <coughs> University of Illinois from this uh, problem. And secondly, with regards to disciplinary uh, diversity, there are, we, we, are, we are in uh, an environment of academic groupthink among the faculty in which certain kinds of approaches are increasingly being squeezed out or eliminated even as members of the public, and in particular for public universities, uh, legislators believe that these matters should be taught. And one of the best examples of this uh, is in my field in history, where there is an expectation among legislators, if you look at any K through 12 guideline uh, that are done by uh, 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 elected bodies, uh, that students will learn about things like uh, uh, political history or military history or legal history, and yet this area is being phased out in the academy. And it is in these areas that trustees have an obligation as part of the principle of shared governance if key areas are not being taught to act to ensure they are, to empower administrators to ensure that new lines are created if necessary. And again, the purpose here is both fiduciary and reputational in effect to save the university from itself. The faculty response to this aspect of the report uh, before it came out traditionally has been this is an area of exclusive faculty reserve trustees should butt out. Uh, and if politicians complain about it, politicians should butt out as well. And that's a nice idea if we think of a pie in the sky approach, but public universities in part rely on funds appropriated by public uh, legislators. Uh, and when the faculty takes a position that they are above receiving any kind of advice from legislators, legislators sometimes will respond by saying, fine, we just won't fund your universities. Um, I'm from Maine. Um, we are now experiencing a crisis in higher education in Maine. The state's second leading university, the University of Southern Maine, had to eliminate three academic departments in the past year and 50 faculty positions because the legislature simply has decided that the university doesn't fit the priorities that the state legislature wants. Um, and while I would like to say that I disagree with the legislature, and I do wish the USM in particular, Southern Maine, could be funded, there is something of a comeuppance here. The fact is that, that uh, the faculty at the University of Maine system have said that it doesn't matter that uh, issues important to the legislature and to the citizens of Maine are taught. And if you take that approach, eventually the citizens are going to decide that universities aren't good enough to be funded. So in both of these areas, personnel matters and curricular areas, it's critical for trustees, and again, I speak here as a faculty member, to act to protect outlying decisions where the faculty, for whatever reason, ideological, pedagogical, uh, or simply pettiness, uh, have decided to set aside the best interests of the university. Thanks. So I, I, I can't help but notice that we have a president, former president, and two faculty members on this panel talking about boards of, of trustees. Um, there's, there's a, there's a, I think Casey is right. There's, there, there's, a, there's a narrative um, among, um, um, among faculty and, and, and administrators, I, I have to say, uh, in, in higher education that marginalizes the role of trustees. And, and I think that misreads badly 
both the history and the purpose of higher education in the United States. Um, we don't have a Ministry of Education in this, in this country. Uh, by deliberate forethought, I think, um, the founders of the colonial universities and, and, the, uh, and the, the explosion of universities in the 19th century um, thought that, that universities were autonomous entities that reported to society in some way, and that, and that the way that they reported to society was through an oversight mechanism like a board of, of, of trustees. And of course, that takes different incarnations depending on the kind of, uh, of institution um, that, you, that you have. So I just want to make a few remarks that, that I think speak to the issue. Um, I, Benno was certainly, was certainly eloquent in, in, in talking about the failures of, of, of governance. Casey knows well the failures of governance. My point is that a failure of governance, particularly among universities, which are supposed to be autonomous, uh, is seldom the fault of one component. It's usually a systemic, a systemic failure. And, and um, maybe it's because I'm an engineer, but I look for systemic uh, problems when I, when I see these kinds of massive, um, um, these kinds of massive failures. So let me begin with, with just two very short, very short stories. Um, my university uh, announced uh, uh, about a year and a half ago an online master's degree in computer science, a MOOC-based master's degree. And we offered this master's degree with two guarantees. One was that the quality of the courses in the degree, the quality of the student experience would be comparable to the residential experience at Georgia Tech. And, and we were willing to guarantee that by not making any distinction on the diploma as to whether the student sat in a classroom for the right number of hours or participated online in the, um, uh, in the program. It's a Georgia Tech, it's a Georgia Tech degree. I, I think it was a position that was not easy for the institution to take and in particular our, our Director of Alumni Relations um, was appalled that we would, that we would do that, but it, it was a position that the Institute, that the Institute took. Um, that degree was approved through the mechanisms of shared, of shared governance. It was, it was proposed by a visionary dean. Uh, it, was, it, was, um, it was discussed by, uh, by, college, by college faculty who overwhelmingly, by a vote of 80%, agreed. They didn't all agree that this was the right thing to do, but they agreed that this, this was an experiment that should be, um, that should be tried. Um, the, uh, the president of Georgia Tech, who had been prepping the Board of Regents for the fact that change was coming in higher education, had absolutely no difficulty presenting this degree to the Board of Regents, which approved it after a 45-minute discussion. We began offering um, admission to the degree last January. Um, we had uh, 10 times more applicants for that program than we, than we anticipated. And we are now on a track to go from zero students to 10,000 students uh, uh, over the course of, of, of a relatively small number of years, maybe, maybe, five, maybe five years. At any point in that process, someone could have raised a red flag and said, we want to stop this. We don't, we don't want it to go, to go forward. Um, and that didn't happen. And, and I don't think it happened because Georgia Tech is this magical, this magical institution. It happened because the rules of shared governance work the way they're supposed to work in, in offering this degree. Will there be another degree? I don't know. I hope so. I mean, I, I think it's, it's really an exciting, an exciting prospect. Um, but, but we don't know. This is entirely an experiment. And that supports the theme that, 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 that I, want to, I want to base the rest of my comments around. That is, in the United States, higher education is a hotbed of experimentation. It has always been that way. That's what you get out of decentralization. That's what you get out of not having a ministry of education. If you look at the growth of institutions post-colonial uh, times in, in America, it's, it's an incredible number of universities. I, when I wrote Abelard to Apple, I tried to count how many institutions had been created from the time that John Adams wrote the Massachusetts Constitution to today. I, don't, I have no idea. I have no idea. Maybe 10,000. Maybe, maybe, maybe more. The current number in the U.S. 
is somewhere between four and 7,000 institutions, which kind of gives you a sense that we really don't know what's going on in these, in these places, but there's a lot of experimentation um, taking place. Um, the second thing that the se th second story that, that, that I want to tell you um, has to do with the position I took in, in Abelard, which was very critical of college presidents, uh, but not critical in the way that, that, that we've heard this morning. Critical because, because they, um, um, they have been recruited by and large to be, um, um, uh, to be shepherds of tradition, not leaders of multi-million dollar enterprises. Uh, and, and I heard from friends, I heard from people that were friends that, that are no longer friends uh, as, as, as a result of that, of that, of that chapter. Uh, but I also heard from people like John Hennessy, um, uh, a longtime friend, 40 year, 40 year colleague and, and, and friend who took six months leave from being president of Stanford to study in detail online education. What a remarkable thing for a president to do, to take a six-month leave to inform himself as to what's going, what's going on. Uh, and, and I think it's no accident that Stanford has been a place that has just been a hotbed of experimentation. There's a rebirth of pedagogy among, among faculty and research institutions in the United States, I think primarily because of what Stanford did. Uh, Stanford hired Carl Wayman, 2001 Nobel Prize winner in physics. It's great to win a Nobel Prize, but Carl Wayman is dedicated to undergraduate instruction. And he brought a group of people to Stanford to study the science of teaching in the way that is unlikely to be done at other institutions. That model is being replicated. Where are the trustees in supporting the growth of those kinds of, of um, uh, of sandboxes, those kinds of, of think tanks that are going to, going to promote, promote change. And we have to have change. Uh, I, think, I think both of the previous speakers and the previous panel um, were pretty clear that, that, that we are at a confluence of events, uh, particularly in the United States, that, that, that demands change. Uh, economically, uh, higher education is non-sustainable. Uh, Clay Christensen estimates that half uh, of uh, the liberal arts institutions in, in this country will be, uh, will be insolvent within, um, within 15, 15 years. We have a maturity of technology that hasn't previously existed. People say, oh yes, we've had online courses for generations. Well, guess what? We really haven't. Um, uh, we've had, we've had um, distance education of the form of making a long distance phone call and, and being quiet for, for a semester. <coughs> And, and <coughs> taking a, an exam that you may or may not um, may or may not pass, um, we have a lack of public confidence uh, in in the value of higher education that is that is unique in our history, and we have a rebirth of interest in pedagogy. All of those things are coming together to demand demand change. Um, the reason I told you the story about the Georgia Tech online master's degree is to kind of hammer home the point that, that there is nothing in these 4,000, 5,000 institutions that, that prohibits that kind of deliberate strategic, strategic action. Uh, and you don't have to be successful every time, every time you, you do it. Um, I think the I think the um, uh, the report um, stands on its own. We had we had a lot of discussion as the report was was being put together over what um, what an, what the new era is. So it's governance for the for the new. So what is the new the new era? It's the place where all those forces that I mentioned are combining. Um, uh, it's a new it's a new it's a new eco uh, ecosystem. And, and and I don't see how how anyone who is a member of the academy trustees to faculty to students can look at the landscape of what's going on and not say that we have to all be involved in this, in this process. So when the alignment works, it's great. When it doesn't work, it's not because there's been a failure of, of board governance or there's been a failure of faculty governance or the president has been out of step. It's because that alignment hasn't, um, hasn't worked well. And, and I think the recommendations in the report are, are as people have said, common sense uh, recommendations for what you should do going forward.
Before we open it up, I just want to ask all three of you, I think in our earlier discussion we heard a lot of questions about, you know, how can trustees do their job, it's a lonely position, they don't have data. What do you think is the biggest challenge for trustees and what's the best way to address it? Well, I think the biggest challenge for trustees, this came up in the previous panel, is to ensure that the leader uh, whom they pick uh, for their college or university uh, shares their values, including their commitment to the public, uh, to the public interest. Um, and uh, the trustees need leaders who will provide the trustees with the kind of data about academic performance, cost, and so forth that enable the trustees to make an independent judgment about whether the institution is on the right track or or, or needs to be uh, corrected. So I think it, you know, trustees very rarely act uh, unilaterally. They generally act through their chancellors or presidents and provosts and deans and so on. Uh, but the trustees have to be sure that those academic leaders share the values that the trustees have for the institution. Uh, uh, just a quick related point, uh, if I may. My view is that the trustees of private institutions owe the public just as much as the trustees of public institutions. Take, take my old uh, institution, uh, Yale. Yale raises between 600 and 800 million dollars a year in gifts. What would this be if those weren't tax deductible? About half, in my view. The Yale endowment is now uh, close to 24 uh, billion dollars. What would that endowment be if contributions to it weren't tax deductible and the gains that the endowment has had over the years have also been uh, not taxed? That endowment would be half or less uh, what it is. Yale gets about 600 million a year uh, from the federal government for various kinds of uh, research uh, and, and that's not counting Pell Grants and other, other things uh, like that. I mean, if you look at the Yale budget, vastly more than half of it really comes right out of the public in the form of tax deductions and uh, research support and Pell and, you know, everything else. And so Yale, the Yale trustees' responsibility is not just to the Yale student body and faculty and the, and, and the alumni and the tradition, it's to the public. The public has been responsible for, at, I think I'm confident, a majority of Yale's uh, financial uh, resources. That's not very different from the picture at the University of Virginia or the University of Michigan. Uh, and so I think that, that, yes, trustees of public institutions act, are acting in a different political environment where they may be accountable to governors and legislatures in a way that, say, Yale trustees are not. But Yale trustees should have no less concern about the public interest because Yale is a publicly supported institution just like CUNY or Michigan or the University uh, uh, of, of, of Virginia. Um, about data, trustees should be open to getting data and information from all sources within the university. Trustees should be active in reaching out to faculty and making it clear that faculty members can approach them with concerns. Uh, and the same with, with students uh, and alumni. When, when we reversed KC's, um, uh, the rejection of, of KC for tenure by the Brooklyn uh, History Department, the reason I got it, I never heard of Casey. My friend from Yale, Don Kagan, uh, the great classicist and a Brooklyn College graduate, wrote me a letter and it was signed by Gertrude Himmelfarb and uh, a, whole, a bunch of other people uh, whose academic judgment 
I knew and had the highest respect for, saying that Casey Johnson was probably the ablest American historian at Brooklyn College, <laughs> tenured or not, and that his denial of tenure was an a polit was politically based and, a, and an academic outrage. Because his field is American history, and I know something about that, I used to teach it here at Columbia for many years, um, I was able to look at his work, make my own judgment, but it was because Don Kagan and Gertrude Himmelfarb and, and four or five other people whom I knew called my attention to it. Trustees need to be open to getting information about what's going on in their institution from lots of different sources. And I think, Ann, it's, it's not a good thing for trustees. I, trustees need to have the institutional leaders provide them with data. And they need to insist on data from the institution's leaders. But they need to be open to information from a wide range of sources about what is going on <laughs> Uh, within their uh, institution. Shall we open it up to sure. some questions and comments? Yes. Not long ago, I had a question, or rather a concern, about college president, and I thought it was appropriate to take it to the Board of Trustees. And in, in finding out how to directly contact him, he's a busy man, obviously, and I was told to go through the secretary. Well, it turns out that the secretary of the Board of Trustees was the president's secretary, which rather stymied me. Um, and later I was told that this was quite common. Is that true? Um, I, yeah, I think it is true. I mean, at Yale, the, the secretary of the university is the, is the board secretary, and that person is appointed by the president. Uh, at CUNY, we have uh, a vice chancellor uh, who uh, serves as secretary of the board. That person uh, is appointed by the president. Trustees need to be open to getting information from, from all sources and not just from what the president and the secretary of the board, uh, who probably was appointed by the president and, and is accountable to the president, uh, not just what the trustees get from those uh, official channels. The official channels ought to provide uh, almost all the information trustees need, but they need to be open to getting information. So you should have been able to just pick up the phone and call it chair of your board or any any of those trustees and they should uh, be ready to listen to you and to and to respond to your concern and that is an issue in this report one of the recommendations is that boards consider having independent staff a recommendation that they have that in their line item if they're a public institution or that they take some of the institutional resources for the hiring of their own staff so that they can have some independent input. And there are a few institutions, and one comes to mind in Minnesota, that actually does have an independent resource for the board. But it is something that we are highly recommending for the reasons you've just heard. And one other point on this is to borrow off a point that Bennett was saying earlier, that, that trustees really need to take some of this responsibility on themselves. They need to make it clear that they are open to receiving guidance from the faculty. For instance, at CUNY, there were members of the Board of Trustees, uh, in my case, who actually came to Brooklyn College and met with students. So students knew who these people were. And if you want the flip side of this, from my own experience, uh, the, the Duke Lacrosse case is sort of a, a, a case study in how trustees ought not to handle uh, a controversial uh, issue. The situation at Duke was a very large board, 37 member uh, board. The custom was that the 36 non-chairman members of the board remained silent uh, and allowed the chairman to speak for them exclusively. The chairman was the person who had played the key role in hiring the, the, the 
then and current president of Duke who, who botched the response to the case. And so in effect, the chairman of the board's reputation was on the line as well, and he took the approach that the president needed to be backed unequivocally, was not interested in hearing advice uh, from uh, anyone else, and was very clear, for instance, that uh, the trustee should not hear about what was going on uh, from uh, members of the lacrosse team. And one of the reasons why this uh, episode blew up in Duke's face is that the trustees were not actively engaged from the start in a way that they needed to have been. Uh, yes. We'll come to you next. Thank you. Um, I'm asking this question from the perspective of uh, a faculty member who became an administrator, uh, went over the dark side about uh, eight years ago, and have dealt with uh, probably uh, four boards of trustees associated with higher ed. And it seems to me that all of the discussion about what boards should be doing, how boards should be educated, how boards should be operated, is based on an implicit assumption that those boards are unified groups who know each other and have a sense of what their own culture of operation is. And I think that generally tends not to be the case. So I'm wondering if you, uh, you would care to reflect on uh, what you would recommend or, or the ways in which you would advise board members not to act as independent agents on a board but to understand who their colleagues are and operate from a sense of culture and community in advancing the institutional agendas rather than thinking in terms of individual uh, approaches. Can I respond? Um, so I've spent a lot of time in front of boards in the last, in the last uh, few years and, and one of the, to, to support your, your, your comments, one of the surprising things to me is how few boards can articulate the mission of, of, their, of their institutions. Uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to imagine a unified board or, even, or even, even a functional board that has never come to terms with what the institution it's overseeing is, is supposed to do. Who is it supposed to serve? What do people learn at that institution? Are there successes at those at those institutions? What happens to average students? You know, is the institution important to its city, to its region, to the to the? the I mean, those seem like very basic questions. I mean, Edwin Slauson, when he when he uh, wrote the first um, real ranking of universities in, in, in 1910, asked exactly those those questions. It, it doesn't it doesn't take a lot of reflection to come up with a, a set of questions like. Like, like that, um, and it's, it's, it, it continues to amaze me that, 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 that you see this in presidents, you see it in, in, in boards of, of, of trustees, um, that there has never been enough reflection about what the mission of the institution is to agree what the, what the next path, path forward might be. When, when I was writing, when I started writing my, my new book, uh, a local CEO brought 12 university presidents for an unscripted dinner. Uh, off the record, no, no, um, no reporters um, uh, present, and, and and you saw you saw in that in that dinner the portfolio of of abilities of of, of presidents. You saw very directed leaders who knew where the institutions were, were going, and and you also saw presidents who probably can't reflect reality to their boards because they don't understand reality. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard a president say, you know, the world will always need. Institution X, where Institution X is their is their institution, and I know what those balance sheets uh, look like. Uh, they're not going to be around in in two years. Uh, we've talked a lot about what boards of trustees should do. Unfortunately, the boards are usually programmed by the staff and administration of the different colleges and universities. How are we going to get the members of the Board of Trustees to stand up and do their job? And that's one of the big problems we have throughout the United States. Well, I think one of the things that trustees ought to insist on is getting at least annually dashboards that are 
put together by independent people that show the performance of the university. Every year at CUNY, we get a dashboard that shows a whole range of information about what faculty appointments have been made across the institution, about graduation rates, about, about retention rates uh, for students, about uh, student academic uh, uh, levels of, of achievement, about how students are doing on external uh, uh, academic uh, assessments. And we can use that data to raise questions. Uh, you know, why is the graduation rate at Bronx Community College 20%? Uh, when at Kingsborough in Brooklyn, it's 75%. Uh, I mean, what's going on? And so uh, the University of Florida system uh, has a, uh, a, perf a set of performance metrics that its a governing board gets every year that I, I think is, uh, is a very, very revealing that tracks institutional performance uh, and financial performance, uh, uh, academic uh, uh, performance, in a, in a very data-driven, metric-based way, uh, and, and relates the performance of a given year to what's happened over the previous five or, or 10 years, so that trustees can get a sense of trends um, you know, sometimes the most important thing is movement. <laughs> it's not the trend that you're, that you're headed in, not where you uh, are at the moment. So I think that um, trustees ought to insist on those kind of dashboards or, or performance metrics like the Florida system has. And the trustees ought to ensure that the data in those in that dashboard or performance metrics is objective. Ben, uh, I have a, a, nothing but the greatest respect for the, for the job that you and Cooney have done over the years in, uh, uh, in providing quality education uh, to the public in the city. It's been absolutely an outstanding uh, a remarkable job that has been accomplished there by, by many thousands of people. Um, as far as, as your comments about trustees, you know, I'd have to say that I think you're looking for a perfect world. And out there in ordinary uh, trustee land where I live, it's far from a perfect world. And, and, and it's more than frustrating. And I think there's a lot of people who, you know, we're just ordinary folks, not any exalted financial people or, or, or certainly ac academicians. Uh, most of us, like myself, hadn't been in, have, before we got onto boards of trustees, um, hadn't been around academia for 40, 50 years. And, and uh, so we have only our common sense uh, to guide us. And, and, and to give you an example of how frustrating it can be, uh, when you talk about getting involved in ed the educational goals of the institution, uh, when I joined the board, I said, well, I want to go to some classes. And so I spoke with the secretary, um, uh, to the president, who was our administrative. I said, I would like to go to some classes next time I come down here for a meeting. And I got a, a lot of silence. And then about an hour later, I got a phone call from the president who said, I understand you want to go to some classes. And I said, yes, I'd like to go to two or three classes and just to sit in and see what's, what's, what's happening. Oh, well, we don't really do that. Nobody's ever done that before. Um, and I said, well, why not? <clears throat> well, it's just, it just isn't done. Um, you, might, you might upset the professors. And I said, well, I would really like an opportunity to, since this is the product that we deliver, um, and I'm a marketing-oriented guy, I'd like to see what we, um, see what kind of education we're providing, what the students are like. I think it would be helpful. Well, I finally got permission uh, to go to classes, providing I got uh, uh, s specific permission from the president of the college uh, for any class I wanted to attend. Um, and I did that for, for several years, and it was very, I, I found uh, quite contrary to the professors being upset about it, they were thrilled that a member of the Board of Trustees was, was uh, 
interested enough in what they were doing to come to a class. Um, the students the same. So it was a very rewarding experience, but it was discouraged. Further, when it comes to finding out what's going on in your college, frequently all, all boards of trustees, we have meetings that encompass faculty and students. Well, those students are obviously handpicked um, um, to give us a very good impression of what's going on. And, and I uh, um, had the practice of, at every board meeting, spending at least one meal on my own in the student union cafeteria and sitting down with a group of students. Well, on one of my infrequent uh, uh, calls to the woodshed, I was admonished for talking to students and, ask, and, and, and discussing uh, what's going on in the college. So in, in, in the world that you've described, that's the way we would like for it to be. But I don't have any idea how to get there um, um, uh, when those, those kinds of activities, which I would think that any person with common sense would want to do, are, are discouraged, frowned upon, and given, you're given, really given a black mark for even, uh, even, even raising those, those issues. Well, that comment, I think, uh, has a number of very important points embedded in it. One is that the responsibility of trustees goes way beyond just attending meetings and reading the stuff that the administration uh, provides for you. At Yale, uh, the trustees, every, every meeting, time was set aside for trustees to go into the residential colleges and have dinner with a randomly selected, self-selected group of students who wanted to sit down with them. Trustees were also, uh, we published to the faculty and to the alumni contact information for trustees so that, so that at Yale, uh, trustees heard from members of the faculty. They attended classes. Remember, when you ask the president, when you tell the president that you want to attend classes, the president works for you. It's not the other way around. Uh, and <clears throat> so I think trustees, a person should not accept an appointment as a trustee unless that person is prepared to put in some time independently of what's provided to the trustees as a body, finding out what students think, faculty think, being in touch with alumni and uh, and having a variety of sources of, of information and trustee that takes time, uh, but trustees should not take on the job unless they're going to prepared to commit themselves to the time that it takes to be open uh, and available and indeed the time it takes to seek out sources of information about about what's. Uh, what's going on. And I think too many trustees view their job as simply attending the meeting and reading the stuff that is, is sent to them uh, before by the president. And that's not enough. Uh, one reason that I was able to make, that we were able to make such huge changes at CUNY that, um, and this, this I think is an interesting point. I was asked by Mayor Giuliani to chair a task force because the mayor thought CUNY was broken, and CUNY was broken. Uh, and I spent over a year and had the assistance of uh, some experts from PwC and, and other people who were the, st who, who, who staffed the task force to study the performance of CUNY, and I wrote a report with very long appendices that had about 250 recommendations for uh, serious things at CUNY that, that needed to change. And that report uh, was embraced by the mayor and was, uh, somewhat to my surprise, also embraced by the then governor, Pataki. And, uh, that those are the two people who appoint the CUNY board. The governor appoints about two-thirds uh, of the board and the chair of the board, and the mayor appoints about a third. So they instructed all their trustees that the Schmidt Task Force Report is the blueprint 
for change at CUNY. And we went out and hired a new chancellor, Matt Goldstein, uh, who read the task force report and said, I agree with this, this is what I want to do. So I came in as a trustee with a lot of independent knowledge about CUNY's problems, and they were huge problems at, at that time. And then because I wrote the report with specific recommendations and the governor and mayor got behind it, we had a, uniform, a unified board uh, and, and, and unity between the board and the chancellor who agreed with the task force report. We actually had a blueprint. And I think it would be useful in some cases for trustees to take some months and study the institution or, or study some aspect of the institution if it's, if it's undergraduate core curriculum, if it's athletics, uh, wh whatever the area that the, a trustee may be concerned about and take the time to develop some independent points of view uh, and get, get grounded uh, in, the, in the data about, about, uh, about those issues. I had that time at CUNY. Uh, and it, it's what gave us, I think, the, the direction and the unity uh, to achieve the changes that we put in place, which have had a huge effect uh, on, on the institution, as you, as you have said. Most trustees, though, are like you. Uh, I, you know, come into the institution, you don't particularly have any special knowledge of it, and I think you need to figure out a way to get that. earlier about the, the, the public money that, that really funds all of uh, private education in this country, don't you think there ought to be requirements and standards for trustees that perhaps uh, 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 ought to be, uh, uh, so we ought to be required to, ha to get this kind of information you're talking about. It ought to be required for that, we, that we go to classes and required that we spend some time being able to study independently. And if we're not prepared to do these things, then we shouldn't accept the jobs rather than just relying on us and our good sense, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, I don't like to say it, certainly in this group, but perhaps the government has, ought to have a role here. <laughs> well, I, I, I agree with you that trustees ought to accept those responsibilities, but I don't, I don't think they should be federally imposed. I mean, I agree with Rich uh, that um, it, it has been the decentralized nature of American higher education that has produced the excellence that we have there, the diversity of institutions. And I think the responsibility of trustees is something that ought to be delineated uh, institution by institution. I think the responsibility of trustees at, at Georgia Tech may be quite different than the responsibility of trustees at Emory. Uh, it's a different kind of institution, has a different purpose. And I, so I don't think federal standards are the answer, but I think trustees need to work, um, work among themselves to figure out what data do they need, what information sources do they need, where are they going to get it, uh, and then do whatever is necessary to, to, uh, to get that data that you need, whether it's taking some time for independent study, whether it's bringing in an outside uh, objective expert who does not work for the administration, uh, wh whatever it is, I think it's best to leave that uh, up to particular boards to define rather than to have a, you know, a uniform uh, federal. Uh, and I, I, I would, I'd like to see board members take risks. I mean, I, I, there's not much difference between between public and private boards of companies and, and, and boards of trustees in, in that respect. How many times do you open section two of the Times and hear about renegade renegade board members? Well, a renegade board member is pursuing something that, that, that he or she thinks is, is important to the, to the company, and, and I, I think trustees of, of universities should be operating the same way. Uh, something that comes from the federal government would, would, would certainly relieve individual trustees of the responsibility of having to 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 be the nail that's sticking up and, and could get pounded down, but that's how that's how change uh, change I think is going to be made. Yes. 
I was particularly interested in uh, the uh, Georgia Tech Online Masters uh, and have a personal interest. I have a grandson who uh, was interested in, in soccer and he's become, he went, he graduated from Browns Grove Academy in England and has become a professional football player in England. He was a top student and he is pursuing uh, a degree at the British Open University, an accredited university, both there and here, uh, as he pursues his career, which is a very different and interesting model, something very different than his parents or I ever expected. Uh, but here, here he is, a very uh, bright top student who is, who is going this route. Now, it occurs to me that uh, uh, there may be potentiality for uh, this alternative model to drive reform in the uh, traditional residential programs, particularly in a day and age in which uh, what was thought to be the great virtue of the residential programs, that is to say a community of learning, has appeared to dissolve into a student consumerist experience rather than a community of learning. So. Uh, uh, I'm wondering whether there are any thoughts about the possibilities of this alternate model driving uh, reforms on some of these governance issues uh, that we're seeing uh, in, in the um, uh, traditional setting. Well, it's, uh, you're right. I mean, it, it, it's transformed undergraduate education at, at, at Georgia Tech. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, the intense focus on our campus um, I guess it's on it's on MOOCs, it's on it's on this particular kind kind of, of course, but but it is actually technology enabled enabled learning that's that's gotten that's gotten the attention, and so and so we now have examples. We're two years into this experiment. We we now have examples of of things that we learned in a classroom of sixty thousand students or a hundred thousand students being taken into into gateway courses on campus, and actually changing learning outcomes. Uh, for, for for all 2,000 Georgia Tech residential students that go through those through those those programs, and and I'm hearing this from our partner institutions, uh, Coursera and, and and edX and the other the other MOOC providers that, you know, you get the headlines for these for these huge massive massive courses, but but you're learning something in the in the process, um, and and to bring it back to the to the the governance uh, issue. Um, I think that's where things can go seriously off the, off the rails, where 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 you 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 provide an opportunity for one stakeholder to derail that that whole that whole uh, uh, that whole line of of, of thinking. Um, you know, our because of the way that the Georgia Constitution has separated the Board of Regents from the political part of of governance, uh, we have political appointees who now feel free to operate. Autonomously, uh, for the benefit of the, of the member of the member institutions, I, I would like to see how that replicates among very different kinds of, 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 um, of, of boards and, and ways of governing public and private universities. I think technology, uh, online technology, online learning, is very likely to transform uh, many a majority of institutions. A majority of institutions in the United States of higher ed institutions are under very severe financial stress. And the fact is the old model of put a professor in front of, uh, you know, some finite, you know, 100 students or 50 students or 20 students uh, is, is just not viable for many of the uh, institutions uh, in our country whose financial model is basically broken. I mean, this is true of many public universities where state support has been shrinking. It's true of the sort of non-wealthy private colleges. Uh, I saw that enrollments are, are well off and, and uh, revenue from tuition is well off and some 40 some percent of our institutions. Clayton Christensen has predicted that, is it 40 or 50 percent? 50 percent of the uh, institutions of higher education that we now have will not exist, uh, what, 20 years from now, 10 years? 15. 15 years from now. So when you have uh, very severe financial pressure on so many institutions, I think online approaches 
are something that uh, trustees need to experiment with and take some risks with. And the fact is that that's an area that most faculties will resist because, because it's, a, it's a new model of learning that challenges the, you know, the traditional role uh, of the faculty member as the uh, sole agent uh, through which the teaching mission of the university or college is, is, is performed. Uh, but I think financial pressures for many institutions are going to require new approaches to learning. But like, you know, like, like all change, I, I, I think the, the, the key to getting things like faculty support, student, student support, is, is that the technology solves a problem. And, and, and on campus, it's not just cost problems. We have, we have learning problems on, on, on campus. If you, can, if you can reorganize the architecture of your institution around things that would have been impossible without the technology, you solve a problem for faculty members. And then you start to see faculty members line up in, in, in support of it. One more question. I think Goldie yeah. had a question. Marketplace is going to test uh, the abilities of st what students know. But they'll also test their work ethics and, and, and that sort of thing. And I'm wondering, with the online courses, have, have we gotten any uh, feedback from the marketplace about the efficacy of those courses and the, and the kind of uh, working ability of the students who have graduated and gone on? From them? Asking, asking me? Um, yeah, yeah, so, so the, um, the, the development of the online courses so one of the deals we made at, at, at Georgia Tech is we would not use any public funds with this experiment. So, so, so we, we found private funds to support the development of the courses. AT&T has underwritten the development of the, um, of the courses for the online masters in computer science. Not that AT&T is contracting with Georgia Tech to develop courses for AT&T. This is a gift. To, to, to support these courses. What we're finding is that, is that, is that employers are lining up for these, for these students. Uh, maybe it's because it's a master's degree, not an undergraduate degree. I don't know, but these, these tend to be directed students. They're the kinds of students who would normally come to us for two years and pay $40,000 for this master's degree, and they're finding that they can complete the degree in an equal amount of time maybe less time, maybe more time, depending on their circumstance, for $6,700. Um, that's a compelling proposition for students. The, the Georgia Tech brand has always been high in this, in this area, and, and, and we have 100% we have um, uh, recruitment from students from, from all, of those, all of those classes, and that's what we're going to see with this one, with this one too. Uh, and and that's, not, that's not a unique story, uh, depending on, on, on how you how you distribute the, the courses, what technology you use, you always find that there's, that there's an employer pull uh, for something that, that the institutions left to the, the traditional programs wouldn't provide. Uh, it's getting to be uh, about lunchtime. Anne, do you want to pronounce a benediction on I'm this panel? I'm going to pronounce a, a brief benediction. Yeah, I, uh, we heard from so many of you, I mean, how difficult it is to be a trustee. And I think ACTA has often said that being a trustee is really uh, a contact sport. Uh, but I think one of the important uh, points in governance for a new era and in the material that are following up, the action plan and the card, is this focus in the Schmidt report on educating yourself. Trustees must educate themselves, as Benno has said, they must find independent information and resources to do that. And um, for, uh, to, to be very uh, crass, the American Council of Trustees and Alumni is here to provide independent resources. That is why we were founded. We are not funded by universities. We're not funded by the government. We are funded by supporters to help provide trustees with independent resources. And that's why we are sending to our database of more than 15,000 trustees information on a regular basis that is designed to help trustees see the national perspective. How do they fit in vis-a-vis -vis other institutions because we have often found that administrations are not forthcoming with comparative information. 
we're there to provide that. And I think we heard from Judge Bray, it was the Virginia ACTA report that gave him the independent information to know that in fact the money he was giving to Virginia colleges was not going to a core curriculum, it was going to other things. So that is indeed why we exist, to provide those independent resources, and we will continue to do that having an education about the history of American higher education, providing trustees with that is again one of the recommendations in this report. Uh, and this will be an area where we will continue to be helping and assisting trustees in education. Another major recommendation is that governors have a responsibility to insist on education of their trustees. This gets back to your issue, should it be federally mandated? What this report says is that governors need to take their appointments very, very seriously and ensure regular training for those trustees. We have reached out to the National Governors Association and we are working with them on that because we do believe that that is an area where more education is necessary and where governors can be much more proactive in helping their trustees have the independent resources they need to do a good job for the public. So I want to say with that, uh, thank you to our incredible panelists who have just done a wonderful job.